But in this new generation, it is happening. Now, this is not the time to go into all of those details, but believe it or not, it is linked. Because one of the main arguments that is presented is a moral, philosophical argument. And it deals with the purpose of our fundraising. It is a very profound argument that is raised by these pseudo-intellectual <laughs> giants. They call them the four you know, prophets of, of atheism. They call themselves the four prophets of atheism. There are people like Sam Harris and Dawkins and uh, 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 Hutchinson and the people of the, uh, uh, Christopher Hitchens and other people of this nature. One of their main arguments is the existence of evil, like we see here, the existence of pain, the existence of hunger. They ask you a simple question. If you had the power to give this child food, would you give it food or would you let it starve to death? And you say, of course I would give it food. Then they flip it around and they say, you say your God is Rahman. You say your God is Rahim. You say your God is the most loving. How can this be happening around the globe? What type of God would allow this? And this is one of many other arguments. Now, time is limited. I'm only going to speak 15 minutes about this and then move on. But we do need to talk about this elephant in the room. We do need to discuss this issue and tie it into what we're doing here today. The fact of the matter is that this issue of trying to understand evil and pain and suffering, it actually goes back to the very beginning of time. Sam Harris might think he's the first genius to come across this question. No. It goes back to before Allah created us. When Allah announced to the angels, إِنِّي جَاعِلُ فِي الْأَرْضِ خليفة, What did the angels say? What was the question of the angels? Oh Allah, why are you creating a species that's going to cause so much bloodshed, so much war? There are going to be civil war constantly. Billions are going to be killing billions of others. They're going to cause fitna and fasad. Now, notice here, by the way, beautiful points. The angels blame the evil on mankind, not on Allah. And this shows, and this is so profound, the bulk of evil, most of evil, most of tragedy, 99% of it, I'm just statistically just saying like that, don't quote me, but the bulk of tragedy is our own creation. We do not manage natural resources well enough. There's plenty of food in the world, by the way. I hope you all know this. There's plenty of food to go around. Everybody can eat and eat healthily. But the rich want to get richer. The most rich 25 people in the world own as much wealth as half of the world's population. Think about that. 3 billion versus 25. The problem, don't blame God, Sam Harris. Don't bring God into the picture. These famines, these wars, these these civil issues, the tragedies, they are human inflicted. And that's why the angel said, Why would you create a species? Their only goal is to kill one another. Shedding blood and causing fasad. And here we are, O oh Allah, pure, praising you, worshipping you. We're not causing any harm. The world is at peace in our world. Their world will not be a world of peace. Why would you do this, O oh Allah? So the question of evil and trying to understand evil was asked even before Allah created us. And the angels, because they are more intelligent than Sam Harris, <laughs> they blame evil where it comes from. Evil doesn't come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's our product. مَا أَصَابَكُمْ بِمُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَرَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ any evil that comes to you, musibah that comes to you, is because of what your own hands have done. So the angels ask the question. They too were wondering, in a more intelligent manner, infinitely more intelligent, but they were wondering, why is this world existent when it's such a damaging world, painful world? Children are dying, people are starving, there's bloodshed here, there's this there. Why, O oh Allah? Now, what did Allah answer? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala respond to the angels' questions by listing the wisdoms of creating mankind? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give a profound philosophical response and said, oh, the wisdom of why I'm creating mankind is da 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 Or did Allah say? What did Allah say, guys? I know what you do not know. What type of response is this? 
response. What type of response is this? The response of someone who is saying, you're going to have to trust me. In other words, if we want to understand the existence of pain and suffering, if we want to ask the question of Allah, why, O oh Allah, why? We have to begin by answering, we will never fully understand. And we must at some level put our trust in Allah because Allah knows and we do not know. Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamu. We begin to answer the question by saying the question cannot be answered fully. When you begin in this manner, you can go somewhere. When you begin by saying the question is unanswerable, you will actually then be able to derive some wisdom, believe it or not. But when you begin by thinking you have the audacity to answer the question, then you will never answer the question. Why? Because for every why, there's a why not. For every if, there's a what if. For every and, there's a because. For every this, there's a you go in an infinite loop. And that is why anybody who has ever spoken with an atheist, you see how futile it is. You go round and round and round and round and you get nowhere. There has to be a level of sami'na wa ta'ina. We hear and we obey. Oh Allah, you know best. I'll never fully understand. I mean, do you really think, my dear Muslim brother or sister, do you really think that our limited, puny, infinitesimally small minds will be able to comprehend the wisdom of Allah? If the angels are told you cannot understand Allah, then who do you think you are? Who do you think I am? That I can understand the wisdom of Allah. To believe in a God whose wisdom we do not understand is the essence of logic and rationality. To reject a God because I don't understand his wisdom is the essence of foolishness and arrogance. Did you get that point here? To believe in a God whom we cannot understand the wisdom, that is rational. I can understand that. I can understand that I cannot understand God. To reject God like those guys have done. And here's the irony. Sam Harris has rejected God, right? These guys, Dawkins, have rejected God because they don't understand evil. Jayyid, then can you explain to me where evil comes from? You have ended up rejecting God. Neither have you yourselves answered the question. Explain to me where is evil coming from then? Neither have you answered the question, and in the process you've also created a million other questions that are even more profound. Who created the universe? Where are we heading? What is the purpose of life? How do we live? Etc, etc, etc. So, they are foolish. Neither have they answered their own questions, nor can they answer the main questions of life. As for us, when we ask why is there pain and suffering, we begin by saying we have to start off by trusting there are wisdoms beyond what we can understand. But, having said that, in the realm of our own understanding, there are some wisdoms. There are some benefits. And I've given a long class and topics and lectures and khutbas and dhurus about this issue. It's called the Odyssey, the Existence of Evil. I only have 10 minutes. I'm going to just summarize some main points. So this is a very summarized lecture of a much longer series I've given. You'll find it online, khutbas and dhurus on this topic. The, the, the issue of trying to understand why there's pain, why are these children dying of starvation? What is the wisdom in all of this? The only way we can begin to understand this is by beginning with the premise that there is a God who has a higher wisdom for us in this life. And some of those wisdoms and some of those benefits are beyond the physical world that we live in. So for example, of the wisdoms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly tells us in the Quran of why there is pain and suffering, why there is evil. Now we're talking about children in, in the Horn of Africa, but all of us have sufferings in this world. I suffer, you suffer. All of us go through tragedies, all of us. Why are those tragedies there? Of the wisdoms given in the Quran, very explicitly, is that Allah wants us to turn to Him and to discover spirituality, to make us realize that this world is not eternal, that the pleasures of this world, the joys of this world are not the end result. That pain and suffering, it wakes us up. It causes us to realize there's a higher purpose. You see, when life is good, when the money is flowing, when the food is plenty, when we're living the life, our heart becomes away from the world. The minute calamity strikes, we discover, oh Allah, help me. 
The minute a tragedy happens, we make dua to Allah. When our family is suffering, the child is sick, that's when we go to the masjid and pray. Guess what? That resurrection of Iman, that rediscovery and rekindling of faith, that is one of the wisdoms for that evil. Ibn Qayyim mentions, any time a pain causes you to reach out to Allah, any time a suffering causes you to make dua to Allah, the blessing of that reaching out, the wisdom of that connection is far more important than the pinch that caused you to turn to Allah in the first place. It is more important that we establish a relationship with Allah than we lose whatever we are losing. We lost some money, we make dua to Allah. Somebody is suffering, we turn to Allah. That turning is a wisdom. Allah says in the Quran, فَلَوْلَا إِذْ جَاءَهُمْ بَأْسُنَا تَضَرَّعُوا وَلَكِنْ حَصَدْ قُلُوبُكُمْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Why didn't they make dua to us when our punishment reached them? They should have turned to us. Allah says in the Quran, مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ What will Allah gain by punishing you if you are thankful to Allah and you believe in Allah? Meaning, one of the goals of worldly punishment is to turn to Allah and believe in Allah. Any pain of this world is bearable. The pain of the Akhirah is not. Any suffering of this world is manageable. The suffering of the hereafter is not. And if I were to ask one of you as well, when were you the closest to Allah in your life? When did you feel the most proximity to Allah? Chances are, you would tell me a phase of your life where you're going through a personal tragedy. Something happened the death of a loved one, a very nasty divorce, a financial crisis, you know, your parents, something happened. And that caused you to rediscover Islam and Iman. So then, we put two and two together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending minor irritations and nuisances so that we can draw closer to Him, so that we save ourselves from the bigger irritations of the hereafter. That is of the wisdom of the wisdoms as well, of why there is pain and suffering, is to remind us of our mortality. We don't live forever. And through tragedy, we are awakened to the reality that life comes to an end. There is death for all of us. We cannot hide it if we don't talk about it. We cannot run away from it, ignore its reality. It doesn't matter if we don't mention it. It is a reality. Every one of us is going to die. إِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتٌ وَإِنَّكُمْ مَيِّتٌ They are going to die, you are going to die. This is in the Quran. وَمَا جَعَلْنَا لِبَشَّرٍ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ الْخُلْدِ No one has lived before you. So, what does pain do? It reminds us of our own mortality. Life is not forever. There is something in the hereafter. And this leads me to my third point. You will never understand the wisdom of suffering unless you believe in the hereafter. You will never understand the wisdom of pain, of musibas, of fitnas, until you connect the akhirah with this dunya. You see, these people who deny Allah, they say, that child died, how could a God do this? And the response is, the child is still alive with Allah. There is a life after this life. And you have neglected the real life, the eternal life. The pain of this child was two years. The blessings of the hereafter is eternity. How can you ignore that? We firmly believe that every single calamity and pain and suffering, without exception, if we turn to Allah, will bring us more positive than negative. The believer is always a winner. Even if they're starving to death, they're a winner in the eyes of Allah. Even if they have no money, they have Allah's Jannah. Even if they have nothing of this dunya, they have Iman and the Quran and Taqwa. The believer is always a winner. No situation arises except that the believer can come out the winner of that situation. If a child dies, our Prophet said, hadith is authentic, that if somebody suffers the loss of a child and they are patient at that loss on judgment day, the child will be told, enter Jannah. And the child will say, no, O oh Allah, I will not enter without my parents. 
So the child will hold on to the hands of mother and father. And shafa'a will be given to this baby child that your parents suffered your loss. Now they will enjoy your fruits. And they will be caused to enter Jannah as a child. Now you tell me, if somebody doesn't believe in Jannah, will they understand the pain of a parent? We have to connect it with the Akhirah. In the hadith we learn, in the hadith we learn that on Yawm al Qiyamah, when the people who have suffered will see the rewards they get, when the people who have tragedies, calamities, will see the reward, and Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ Those that are patient will be given the reward without measure. So these people are being patient. They will be given the reward without measure. The hadith says, when they see the blessings that they will get on Qiyamah, they will say, Oh Allah, send us back to the dunya. And give us even more calamities. So that we can meet you with even more hasanat. The people themselves will not be complaining that who are you, Mr. Sam Harris, to complain on their behalf. They themselves will be happy with what Allah has given them. Because this dunya is not the end. This dunya is the beginning of the next. And what they get in the next world will make everything of this world worthwhile for them if they have iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of the reasons why there is pain and suffering, and with this we come to the purpose of our gathering here today. And it has to be said. One of the wisdoms of evil, of hunger, of poverty, of children being orphaned, is not that Allah loves evil. No. In fact, the Quran is explicit. Wallahu la yuhibbul fasad. Allah does not love evil. The Quran is explicit. Allah is not con content with kufr and fasad. The Quran is explicit. Allah does not enjoy punishment. We don't have a sadistic God. We have Rahman and Rahim. We have Malik and Qudus. This is our Lord. Of the wisdoms of the existence of hunger is not that Allah loves people that are hungry, but Allah loves those who feed the hungry. Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. Allah loves those who give charity. Allah loves those who sponsor the orphan. Allah loves those who give up their wealth even as they need it. Now, simple question. How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love the one who feeds the hungry when there's no hungry person to be fed? Where will that person arise? How can Allah reward the sponsor of orphans? when there are no orphans to be sponsored. How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give hasanat to the one who gives of his own money even though he loves that money when there is nobody to whom money can be given? And this is where we come in. The goal of hunger is not hunger. It is that those of us who are not hungry can share our food and our wealth with those who are hungry. Miskeen and wayateem and wasira. They give up their own food, even though they need it and they love it, to the miskeen, to the orphan, to the prisoner. And they say, we are feeding you for the sake of Allah. Don't thank us. Our Lord will give us our reward. The one who rejects the religion ends up not encouraging the feeding of the hungry. The one who believes in religion wants to feed the hungry. Allah says in the Quran, when they are told, give your food to those who are hungry, they say, Why should we give food when Allah can feed them directly? This is in Surah Yasin. When the believers say to the unbelievers, Come, let us give our money and food to the hungry. Those who reject Allah say, let Allah feed them directly. And the believers want Allah to use them to feed the hungry. And the kuffar use Allah as an excuse to not feed the hungry. Did you guys get this one? It's a very deep point. I want to repeat it. Please pay attention. The believers, they want to be used by Allah to feed the hungry. 
They know Allah feeds the hungry. But how does Allah feed the hungry? Will something open up and it will rain meat and bread from the sky? Allah uses musabbibul asbab. Allah uses asbab. And we want to be those asbab. We want to be the channels that Allah uses. So the believers understand that those that are hungry is a trial for them and it's a trial for us. Those that don't have a roof, it's a fitna for them and a fitna for us as well. The fitna for them is obvious, Allah is testing them. But there's a fitna for us. Allah is testing us as well. Are we helping? Are we doing something? And this leads me to my final points. Yes, we are all fatigued and tired at fundraisers. But we need to understand one simple thing. As Ibn Qayyim says, the true believer, the true giver of charity realizes that he is more in need of the beggar than the beggar is of him. You and I need this cause more than this cause needs us. Because we need to do our minimum in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we are not punished by Allah. We need this cause more than this cause needs us. We need to continue to give and every single charity that is worthy to give and not complain about the quantity of charities. Brothers and sisters, the money that we have is not our money. It is Allah's money. We need to get rid of this psychological problem. وَآتُوهُمْ مِنْ مَالِ اللَّهِ الَّذِي آتَاكُمْ And give to them from the money of Allah that He has given you. It is not your money in the first place. Stop ascribing the money to yourself. وَآتُوهُمْ مِنْ مَالِ اللَّهِ الَّذِي آتَاكُمْ And give to them from the money of Allah that Allah has given to you. You didn't earn the money, Allah gave it to you. You didn't get the money, Allah granted it to you. Now that you have it, Allah is going to ask you, what did you do with it? Remove from your minds this notion, how long am I going to give my money? Hadith and Tirmidhi. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ. It's a beautiful story, by the way, beautiful story. Actually, let me elaborate, because it is beautiful. There were two brothers in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. One of them a rich businessman and one of them a student of knowledge. The student of knowledge would sit all day with the Prophet writing halaqa, memorizing Quran, durus. He wanted to become a scholar. And his older brother was wealthy. He has agriculture, he has animals. He has... So the younger brother would stay with the older brother. And the older brother would say, why are you wasting time? You know, go ahead, come and help me in my business. And he didn't need help, he just wanted more money. And the younger one would say, I'm with the Prophet I'm studying. I want to learn, I want to be with him. He wasn't lazy, he wasn't just lying in bed. He was a student. When you're a student, you know you cannot, and not just a student of engineering, a student with who's the teacher? The Prophet So one day the older brother grew fed up with this younger one. Irritated. He marched to the masjid. He said, Ya Rasulullah, my brother sleeps under my roof, eats of my food, takes from my wealth, and does nothing. Complaint. You guys hear the complaint? Now listen to what the Prophet said. And with that, let us correct our attitude when it comes to money. With three words, the Prophet destroyed his ego. My wealth, my food, my risk. لَعَلَّكَ تُرْزَقُ مِنْ أَجْلِي in fact, in all likelihood, your risk Allah is giving to you because of Him, not because of you. Your wealth is not even for you. Allah made you wealthy, not for you. You are not the intended recipient. No, it's your brother that Allah wants to give the money to. But since you are the vessel and the recipient, since you're the one who is having the wallet, you can benefit but it really wasn't meant for you. Allah gave you that wealth so that your brother would have a house to live in, so that your brother has the risk. It was meant for your brother. Stop complaining about being generous. On the contrary, you owe your brother more than what he owes you. Think at the difference of mentality, brothers and sisters. The reason why perhaps we have this money is so that we can give it to others. So that we benefit, yes, we carrying the wallet, we get to benefit. 
But perhaps Allah is giving us money so that we can give others that money. And Allah has allowed us to enjoy that money in a halal manner. But we weren't the intended recipients. It's the people there in the Horn of Africa. It's our Syrian refugees. It's the people in Burma. It's the local madrasa. And when we give, Allah will continue to give us. That's the blessing of our dunya and deen. When we give, Allah will continue to give us. Final point, and then I'm done. Hand it back to Sheikh Nikad and the others. I want to conclude with a beautiful story in the seerah that all of us are aware of. Beautiful story that really summarizes for us the concept of charity and being generous and giving to others. The story is that of Musa when he fled from Fir'aun and he went to Madian. You all know the story when he, in his anger, he punched the, the Egyptian and the Egyptian died, accidental death, manslaughter. Fir'aun said, go find Musa and execute him. So they came hunting for, for Musa. Musa fled with nothing except the clothes on his back. He didn't even have his wallet with him, didn't have any money, nothing. And فَخَرَجَ مِنْهَا خَائِفًا يَتَلَقَّبُ He fled the city in fear and worry, and he just fled anywhere, out to scale to run away, until finally he reaches the Sinai Peninsula, the land of Madian, and he found a well. And tired, hungry, he himself is a refugee. He doesn't know where his meal is going to come from. He has no clue where he's heading after having been raised in the palace, by the way. So from where to where? Complete refugee. In the creme de la creme, in the palace of Fir'aun, now he is a refugee without a roof, without food, without water, without a penny. And if anybody has an excuse to be stingy, right now it's Musa. But the story, as you all know, he comes to get some water, but before he gets the water, he finds there are two ladies with their small flock and they're far away, and there's all these men jostling and shoving with their flock around the well. And he said, what is your matter? Why are you over here? They said, we don't have any brothers, our father's an old man, and we can't go and jump in amongst the men. We can't go and we have to wait until all the water is gone, when hardly any is left. Whatever is left, we just get that for our flock. If anyone has an excuse to be selfish right now, it's Musa. He could have said, you're not even Muslim. He was Muslim, they're not Muslim. He could have said, I don't know you guys, I'm not from the same ethnicity. He could have said, I don't have any money to give you, and he would have been right. He could have said, I'm a refugee, I have better things to worry about than somebody else. But then he wouldn't be Musa, would he? He wouldn't be a prophet. In spite of his situation, having nothing to give, he gave the only thing he could, and that is the sweat of his brow. Having nothing to give, he gave 10 minutes of his time. That's all he could give. So he volunteered to take those flock, and he jostled and shoveled with the other shepherds, complete strangers, complete strangers, women who cannot benefit him, any finances, any food, nothing. And he feeds their flock, he goes back, and turns away without even waiting for a thank you because he's doing it for the sake of Allah. And as he comes under the tree, he makes that famous dua, that beautiful dua, one of my favorite duas of the Quran. Qala Rabbi, what did he say, guys? Qala Rabbi, inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqir. He said, Oh Allah, I am a faqir to anything you can. Musa said, I'm faqir, oh Allah. I'm faqir, I have nothing, oh Allah. And he had nothing. Literally, he had nothing. Didn't even have food to eat. Not a penny on his, in his pocket. He said, Rabbi, I'm faqir. Whatever you give me, I am happy. In the state of faqir, he still gave to those two ladies. SubhanAllah, what happened? What happened, my dear brothers and sisters? Barely an hour goes by, and Allah responds to his dua because of his generosity. When he gave to others, Allah gave back to him. One of these two walked back, shy, bashful. She says, my father is calling you. He wants to thank you for what you have done. And subhanAllah, within an hour of his act of charity, he has a roof over his head, he has food to eat, he has a career for the next 10 years, and mashallah to sweeten the deal, he's got a wife as well. 
Brothers, if you're single, you just give water to the passerby. You don't <laughs> make dua out of his own, inshallah. By the way, only single brothers. That only works for the single brothers. Huh? Don't get any thoughts. Those are married. No, no, no. That doesn't work anymore. Be careful. Very careful. Yes, very careful. But in this story, there's so much profundity. When you give, Allah will give back to you. Simple as that. Stop complaining about fundraisers. Thank Allah that we are here at the donor dinner and not waiting for the recipients to give. Thank Allah we are writing the checks and not waiting for the checks to come. Thank Allah that we are in the air-conditioned halls waiting to go back home, food, air conditioning, everything ready. And the people on the other side, they are with Allah's dua and help waiting for us to give to them. Don't complain and realize that perhaps we have been given our wealth in order to help these other people. That's why Allah is giving us wealth. So give whatever you can give. And give today and tomorrow when the, there's the other fundraiser, you give for that as well. And continue to give because the Lord of the throne will continue to give back to you. As the Prophet said to Bilal, O oh Bilal, keep on unfiq and the Lord of the throne, yunfiq alayh. You give to others, Allah will continue to give to you. This is the beauty of our religion and it is one of the reasons why pain and suffering exists. Not because Allah loves pain and suffering, but because Allah loves other people good people to stand up and fight to minimize the pain, fight to minimize the suffering, fight to help the people who need to be helped. Allah does not love poverty and hunger, but Allah loves those who are fighting against poverty and hunger. Our goal is to be of those people. Our goal is to be of the people at the forefront, making a change in the world, making a positive change in the world. That is why we are here. That is the ultimate goal we have. Brothers and sisters, do whatever you can, whenever you can with whatever you have that is all that Allah requires of you nothing more than this may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to give to us so that we may give to others may Allah azawaja never test and try us with more than what we can bear may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause our hearts to love the Quran and Sunnah and to be with the Masakeen may Allah cause our hearts to be tender for the orphans and the widows may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause our wallets to be ever generous to those who need may Allah accept from us and overlook our shortcomings may Allah Allah continue to give to us and never deprive from us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make every single day and month and year for us better than the previous one so that our best day is the day that we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah that we live as Muslims and die as mu'mins and that we are resurrected with the prophets and the companions and what a noble companionship they are. Which is Akumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Zakat al-Akhir,